this is a song that I have sung several times over the years, and I really like the song. It talks about the difference that Jesus makes. But uh, I was looking at this last week, and there's uh, some verses that I had never sang before and not heard much. And so I figured y'all would want to sing all these verses. So are y'all ready? Once I was lost in sin I had no peace within To save my weary soul I knew not how But Jesus came to me And by His grace I'm free Now it's different It's different Lord, 
Bibles, turn with me to the book of Joshua, to the book of Joshua chapter 10, as we look at the first part of, well, actually as we preach through the book of Joshua, and as there are many, I believe, applications for our day, but last Sunday we looked at the prelude to the longest day. Tonight we're beginning the part of it, of that chapter, living the longest day, Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, and we will begin reading with verse 7 and following. Now before that is where the confederation led by Adonai Zedek has converged upon Gibeon with the intent to annihilate Gibeon, which of course had signed a treaty of peace with Joshua and Israel under false pretenses, but nevertheless the name of Jehovah God was invoked and so they cry out to Joshua, send messengers, and say, Do not forsake your servants. And so Joshua honors the commitment made in the name of Jehovah God and responds. So that's where we are, looking at verse 7 and following. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. May God bless the reading of his word. Living the longest day. Joshua trusted God for the miracle power that he needed to win the battle. And simply put, you and I, we trust God today for the same miracle power that we need to win in whatever battles that we may face. June the 6th, 1944, was in many ways the longest day. It was D-Day, the Normandy invasion. It began a little bit before midnight on June the 5th in a break in the weather. The day before, almost hurricane force winds a small window of opportunity. The largest airborne operation in history was underway with the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne with the United States and, of course, the Allies. Then came the amphibious assault on the beaches, codenamed Sword, Juno, Gold, Omaha, and Utah. I had family that was, I believe, on Utah and are, and on, and are on Omaha, if I'm not mistaken. Intense withering. Weapons fire erupted all around. War plans did not match the actual conditions due to the unpredictable nature and so-called fog of war, as well as human nature that can often create chaos and confusion. Many secondary targets were not achieved or the timetables were not achieved. In fact, it was General Ted Roosevelt, a.k.a. Theodore Roosevelt Jr., who was the, uh, one of the line officers who actually is on the beach, and if you've ever seen the movie, The Longest Day, I want to say that his part is played by Henry Fonda, if I remember correctly. It's a wonderful movie, kind of a documentary feel to it uh, and everything, but it really happened, and so they were trying to figure out where are we because where they were didn't match up with their maps, and some, well, do we need to try to get back? Uh, this is under withering fire. Do we need to go back to the boats? No. Our war begins here, gentlemen. And thus he paraded up and down the beach with his swagger stick or his cane uh, to rally his troops. What an amazing uh, act of courage. Many, many perished. Omaha was the most grievous of the challenges. A lateral current pulled the landing craft off their targets. Units did not land together. Heavy machine gun fire began hitting the landing craft before they debarked the troops. Men who reached shore were pinned down behind obstacles under the seawall or at the base of a bank of loose stone. 
The difficulties experienced by the first assault waves affected those to follow. That a beachhead was even seized can be attributed to the weight of the air and naval support and to the courage of individual leaders, afraid or fearless, who knew that the men must be let off the beach or face certain death. By evening, there was a beachhead. It was only about a mile and a half deep, but there was a beachhead. For many, it would seem as if that day would never end. Martha Bird, A World in Flames. In the time of Joshua, the Hebrews would fight an equally fierce battle against this five kingdom or five nation alliance led by Adonai Zedek. God repurposed that situation into an occasion to inflict a punishing blow against this alliance at one time. Yes, it would be a bitter, hard-fought battle. Dr. Harold Wilming, Willing, try it again. Dr. Harold Wilmington states that God would empower the Hebrews to fight what would become a total of seven successful battles gaining control of southern Canaan. So this is the southern campaign, if you're breaking down the, the different military campaigns of the conquest of Canaan. And this is probably the most well-known because it is Joshua's longest day. As we think about what occurred on that day, God empowers his people today to fight and to prevail in their battles no matter how bitter. Joshua prayed and he trusted God for the miracle power that he needed to win such a battle. God had assured him of his presence and provision and power that was needed to win. And in our own mission field, that's what we can think of Chunky, that's what we can think of Newton County, that's what we can think of the state of Mississippi or the entire United States, not to mention the entire world itself. In our mission and ministry field today, there are yet battles to be fought and won of various kinds, shapes, and sizes. And we will do so, but we will do so only by God's grace and his power applied in our lives. So as we continue to take this snapshot of living the longest day, I would have you note the Lord first assured Joshua. He gave him the assurance of his deliverance. Was it a bitter battle? You bet. It was a bigger battle than had previously been waged? Oh, yes. It was a desperate battle of existence, most definitely. That is, for Adonai Zedek, who had no idea the buzzsaw that he was about to run into. Not that Joshua is such an amazing leader, or that the so-called army of Israel is such a, a highly trained elite force, but that God is faithful to his covenant promises and that the power of God will prevail Irregardless, God guaranteed victory. Joshua was already en route, probably reluctantly, maybe a little hesitantly, maybe a little bit on... I noticed the number of times God speaks to Joshua, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And if we're honest, when we have challenges in our life, they may be medical, they may be financial, they may be emotional, uh, they may be something physical, or it, could be, or it could be something spiritual going on. And, and fear is sometimes a response. We, we, we get that. We understand that. I suspect Joshua, if he's human, had a little bit of that, a little bit, oh, great, we've got to go to Gibeon. <laughs> Whoopee, that'll work. Knowing that they're uh, coming up against an unparalleled force, and God is reassuring them. But he's already en route. He's honoring that commitment that had been made in the name of God. And God is going to be fulfilling that which he spoke to Moses and had proclaimed previously. He says in Deuteronomy 7.24, He will hand their kings over to you, and you will wipe out their names from under heaven. No one will be able to stand against you. You will annihilate them. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, No one shall stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And in our experience, now while we may not be fighting a, a, a pinched, desperate battle, we 
may not be uh, getting arms and marching to, to claim some type of territory in a logistical sense or in a military sense, but we do so in very much a spiritual warfare sense. And the same God who said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not forsake you is the same God who speaks through his son, Jesus Christ, who tells us to go into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, making disciples as we are in the process of going, even though we will face challenges unprecedented and coalitions of all different kinds that would love to see the church annihilated and wiped out. And he says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. He will never, ever forsake us. The assurance the assurance of his presence, the assurance of his deliverance. And then there's the assurance of their defeat, that is, of the enemy. The alliance would fall. It would fail. Not a man of the enemy would stand. God is reassuring Joshua of this, that of his prior promises made in the time of Moses, there's not a time stamp on that. There's not an expiration date on that. Fear had no part or no parcel in the fight of faith. The enemy alliance was being personally delivered to Joshua. Can you imagine that? They, that is the enemy, being set up. Joshua is being set up to succeed. The enemy is being set up to fail, or rather to fall. Why? Because God is bringing his judgment to bear upon the Canaanites. Sometimes we think of that the Old Testament is just violent and bloodthirsty, and it may look that way, but really, look at the, the righteous nature of Jehovah God. He must judge sin. And the fact that he had not wiped out Canaan or the inhabitants of Canaan up to that point is much to the grace of God, who is not desirous that any should have to perish, but that the wicked would turn from his or her way and come to him, and yet they would not do so. They would not have any of it. And there comes a cutoff point. And God says, I will honor your choice. But in honoring your choice, that means I must bring the judgment and the wrath to bear. And so therefore, God is justified in doing what he does. The scholars tell us that, that the hand, in other words, by, when you hear in Scripture, by God's mighty right hand, uh, that the term hand is a symbol of power. Zedek would be at the mercy of God's power employed by Joshua. None can do anything about it, especially not Adonai Zedek. Joshua put his faith into action by a 15 to 20 mile forced march in the dark, up a road that rose to approximately 3,000 feet, that is the ascent to Beth Horon, assured by God, Joshua was able to be bold. Assurance allowed Joshua then to act, and his action was a surprise attack. The uh, surprise attack God was able to use because Joshua had been obedient by faith. God used that surprise attack to be able to multiply his power. God honored his word. God honored Joshua's word. So as we think about the assurance factor, then how might we apply that tonight as we think about our own mission field? Our own mission field is full of both the lost and the needy souls and spiritual enemies. We are meant to conquest and to possess, not surrender the field. I used to tell my students, never walk off the field. Do not surrender the field. When you step onto the field, you take the field. You hold the field. Now, some of them thought I was talking about football. I actually was in reference to track, but uh, you know, either one will work. But spiritually, sometimes, you know, we, as, as not just us personally, but the church, uh, sometimes we take to the field, but then when we see the size of the opposition against us, our, our first response is, well, we're going to die, and we go. And we surrender the field and never once really uh, say, you know, I'm, I'm staking my claim on this yard line. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to back off. Why? Because the power uh, that is within me, the power that is behind me is greater than the power of the enemy that is coming against me because his name is Jesus Christ. Never surrender the field. Ever surrender the field. We do not surrender the field. Do you and I have the faith of Joshua to then run to the battle in the dead of night 
up a hill 3,000 feet. I am impressed with audacity, provided that it's godly. Now, if it's ungodly, not so much. I, I don't like ungodly audacity, but an audacious faith that says, let's go. And they do, not just talk about it. Some people talk a good game, but until they actually throw down and do it, it's just all talk. Just like I used to tease my students about being the best Monopoly player in the world. Um, and, and different ones, Brother Moore, we want to take you on a Monopoly. Like, Bring it. Come on, if you, think you're, if you think you can handle it. But I never once played them. I, I just couldn't shatter them or hurt them that way. I mean, I'm, I'm humble about that. So, in other words, I never, so I really, all that is was taught. Now, I like to think that I can play Monopoly well, and, and probably if you've never played me, it would be a, a probably a good game. But you figure out my style after about two or three games, oh, yeah, we got this figured out, okay? Then I have to play a scorched earth policy. Nobody wins. So anyway, the point is, is that if it's all talk and no, no work, no deeds, that's not good. But to have that audacious faith like Joshua says, okay, God said it. Guys, let's load, let's go in the dark, up the road, up the hill, 3,000 feet, because why? God's going to hand us the enemy. Do we have that kind of faith to run to the battles, especially in light of and in honor of our commitments to the Lord and our commitments to others in the name of the Lord, whether it's a pandemic or not? Our own mission field needs us to be mighty men and women of valor today even amid the presence of pestilence. And yes, we are to expect some intense battles. Yet it is Jesus, through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit, who arms us with that strength for the battle. Whatever that battle may be, we have the strength to face it, and we are already more than conquerors in Christ. It's not a case of that we might win. We already have the power on our side and we're already a victor and a, an overcomer because that is what we are. That is our spiritual DNA in Jesus Christ. In our own mission field, there is no place for fear in the fight of faith. The Bible says, He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Psalm 91, verses 4 and 5 quoted that verse many times to myself when I've been laying back in the dentist chair and you, you, you have that drill there it goes and, and you're waiting for that shot of electricity to, if they, they hit that nerve um, if they do their job right uh, you don't really feel anything but sometimes it's getting to that point where your, your uh, nerve is, is dead uh, and there's still those times if it's been on the bottom uh, to, it don't matter, you can, I can still feel it and so there have been times where I've had some, some uh, mega dental work uh, that I'm lying there and I've quoted that verse now you say well that's mundane no but it was a spiritual battle for me God, any battle is, is important to God therefore we should give our fear to him and ask him strengthen our faith Deuteronomy 3.22, you shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. When the Lord goes before you, no one or no thing can stand against you. You and I, as I just said, are already overcomers. And therefore the spiritual forces of darkness, the things that Paul warns us that our, our wrestling is not with flesh and blood, but with the powers and the principalities, uh, the, the forces of the darkness of this age, and they can be considerable, and yes, they can be frightening, because spiritual warfare is very real. But with that said, our God is very real, and those forces do not truly understand the buzzsaw that they run into any time that they try to prevail against God's people or God's word. D-Day inspired a monumental movie, as I've alluded to, based on the book The Longest Day by Cornelius Ryan and produced by Daryl F. Zanuck. It was a multi-actor cast with three directors and multi-site locations in different countries. The intent was to show the monumental effort utilized by the Allies to execute a sustained, successful cross-channel invasion. It was meant to be one epic history lesson, and again, it's still one of my favorite films. You have uh, all sorts of stars making glorified cameos from John Wayne to, as I said, Henry Fonda, uh, some others that you might recognize, based on the people that really lived it. Well, Joshua's longest day was an epic event, direct 
from the hand of Almighty God. So we look at our second major uh, area. The Lord not only assured Joshua, the Lord answered Joshua. God's answer was in the form of specific acts of intervention. Adonai Zedek and his allies were then targeted by God. When God goes before you and he fights your battles, he's not going to leave anything to chance or have an uh-oh. He has it well in hand. First, there's a terrifying answer. It says, so the Lord routed them before Israel. Joshua 10.10, 10. in the language of the Old Testament, the word vehunimim means to make a noise, and it relates to confounding or confusing, causing a commotion. God's intervention caused the enemy a great confusion. A surprise attack uh, is not something that you're expecting, hence the term surprise. There was a movie that came out a few years ago where the... The protagonist, there was a group of people are, that are in the Smithsonian, and they're about to launch an attack to rescue some friends who have been you know, taken hostage. And so as they, are, they make their big entrance, they shout, we are not going to attack, and then they attack. Now, I know it was kind of weird, but that was their, their big thing. Um, well, in this case, you kind of have an idea that they're about to launch an attack. You can be ready. But in a true surprise attack, you don't see it coming. And when it occurs and it's coming from all around you, God is using that to stir confusion. He's not the author of confusion, but he's using that moment of confusion to terrify the enemy, causing great agitation. They were left uncertain and unbalanced. And Joshua then is able to press the attack. It would appear that Zedek and his armies were shrouded by the fog of war, blown into their faces by Jehovah God. One Bible teacher, Dr. Donald Badvig, says, A forced march under cover of darkness was another of Joshua's well-planned strategies, a distance of about 20 miles in 8 to 10 hours. The surprise attack was used of God to create disorder. Human effort and divine intervention worked in tandem. Surprises that can cause fear, confusion, that can exacerbate problems, that then slow or stymie a response. And that's exactly what Zedek and his allies were experiencing. So the Lord, it says, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, Joshua 10, verse 10. Zedek had unleashed upon himself what he had intended for Gibeon, and therefore the armies of Israel. Remember, it goes back to the covenant. God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. Those that would hinder you and hurt you, then they're bringing that upon themselves. I will hinder and hurt them. God is being faithful to his covenant. Death and destruction were going to be on decisive terms. God empowered Joshua's attack. In the spirit of the language of the Old Testament, God is using Joshua and the circumstances to smite a fatal blow. We don't use that word in modern English, smite, okay? So maybe a word that you and I are more familiar with is to strike a fatal blow. Now, I've watched some um, boxing matches in my time, uh, usually on the Olympic side, watching the Olympics. And I've, I've, you know, I've watched them as they're, you know, pounding. They're doing the little footwork, and they're just doing. I'm like, come on, guys, this is a fight. Let's, let's hurry it up, okay? This is not a dance, all right? Uh, this is not. Uh, can we hug each other, catch our breath? You know, let's let's see some good old-fashioned, you know, left hook. You know, it's just something there. And sometimes it's amazing how they can take a pounding and keep on going. is is beyond uh, beyond me. And other times I've seen people one punch. That's it. I mean, they're they're gone. TKO. Well, I promise you, in this case. Zedek is not going to be just knocked out. He's going to be put down. It is striking a fatal blow. God did not hold off. He did not hold back. The number slain is probably appalling. On an epic scale, it will be the stuff of legend by the enemies, and it will be the stuff of faith by the Israelites. Excessive in a holy sense. It's not death just for the sake of death, but it is judgment that is making a point. A mass casualty event, maximum carnage. I, I know those words, Ugh, I don't know why he would say that. But God is making a point that he will bless them that bless Israel, and he will curse them that curse Israel. Theodore Roosevelt, the president, one time said, don't hit at all if it is honorably possible to avoid hitting, but never hit soft. God, through Joshua, hit, and he hit hard. So the Lord, and it goes on in verse 10, chase them along the road that goes to Beth Peron. Can you imagine God getting after you and not letting you go? 
enemy combatants, not dead or dying, they fled the field. They retreated. The Hebrew word can mean pursuit, but it also can mean persecute. God, through Joshua, gave chase. He gave hot pursuit, and he is pressing the attack, prosecuting the war, harassing the enemy all along the route. I suspect that those who were trying to flee felt a sense of persecution, no respite, no relief. Madnik says, In disarray, the enemy fled down the mountain through the pass of, at Beth Horon and headed south. Even in fight or flight, even in retreat and aggress from the field, God is continuing to strike. When he gets started, he doesn't stop. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon that the Lord cast down large hailstones on them as far as Azekah and they died. Verse 11, God is now employing his version of the big guns, the heavy artillery. During World War II, the 240 millimeter howitzer was the most powerful weapon deployed by U.S. field artillery. It could fire a 360 pound high explosive projectile some 25,225 yards, whatever it was being directed at. And it could take out heavily reinforced targets. It was first employed at the Anzio Beachhead, Italy, 1944, destroying the key bridges at long range. That was an awesome thing. Devastating firepower with incredible accuracy. God is unleashing hailstones with the same deadly accuracy. The term shalak means, according to the scholars, it means to flee. We're not taking, I don't have anything up here I could fling at you, uh, so it's okay. But just pretend I had something I could just fling. We're not talking about just a little cho tossing it out there. No, 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 not doing that. We're talking about taking it, you know, and we're talking about flinging it and flinging it and just keep on and keep on. It's all in the wrist. It's all in the wrist. And just flinging it on again and again and again. They did not just drop from the sky. God flung them purposefully, and he flung them powerfully. It was unlikely. I don't believe it was pea size. I don't think it was dime size. I don't think it was quarter size. I suspect at the very least it's baseball size, and some have probably uh, would correctly surmise it might have been grapefruit or even basketball size. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 9, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as not been seen in Egypt since its founding until now. It goes on to say, The Lord sent thunder and hail. Fire darted to the ground, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. God uses hail to express his displeasure, and he uses it as an act of judgment. And as I have understood that event of the ten plagues, those were hundred pound hailstones. That would be approximately a basketball size. Can you imagine being out in that storm coming over chunky, 100 pound hailstones. That's going to do sufficient damage to not only uh, buildings and trees and cars, but if you're outside in it, it's going to give you a sufficient headache. Huge hailstones, 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, because its plague was extremely severe. In the book of the Revelation, chapter 16, 21, there is a, a future day coming when God is pouring out his wrath upon sin and re unrepentant human beings, and so that hailstones are coming, and rather than say, oh God, yeah, we messed up, oh God, have mercy, they continue to shake their fist in the face of God, unrepentant, un unwilling to change their ways even because as they look at the hailstones they continue to blame God for choices that they made in Job chapter 38 22 through 23 have you entered the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail which I have reserved for the time of distress for the day of war and battle this was God speaking to Job hailstones were miraculous their source was God. Their size, large. Their, their swath, their, their area was a, a huge area from as, as far as Azekah. Their situation during a running retreat without any type of cover, according to Dr. John MacArthur. And then there's a triumphant answer. It says, There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed it with the sword. Joshua 10, 11. Because it was God's battle. 
and therefore God's victory. Joshua is merely the participant. He's the recipient. He's the instrument. And Israel would be able to move on to, to win what scholars would call the southern campaign. Israel's enemy being dramatically delivered into their hand. And survivors, if there were any, would have been stunned and scared by, beyond comprehension. No doubt, no second guessing as to the source of that victory. In our own mission field as we apply it, as we anticipate bringing this particular moment to a close in a moment, in our mission field, God can and He does display His mighty power in answer, in response to our prayers of faith. And His is an answer that can be terrifying, especially to the spiritual enemies that we face. He goes before us. He intervenes for us so that we can go forward and all the while go forward by faith and action. The Lord will cause His glorious voice to be heard and show the descent of His arm with the indignation of His anger and the flame of a devouring fire with scattering tempest and hailstones. Isaiah 30, 30. If God is for us, who can be against us, said Paul in Romans 8, 31. The same God who flung the hailstones is the same God who knows how to fling the, the same type of, of uh, weaponry against the spiritual forces arrayed against us in 2021. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Luke 10, 19 in the ESV. Now keep in mind, that was with the early disciples in the early church. God was giving that as signs to the, to the uh, non-believing Hebrews that yes, the Messiah, God Almighty is doing a new thing. I'm not one of those that says, hey, uh, next Sunday night, uh, let's bring our rattlesnakes to church. If you can find them, uh, bring Big Bertha in, we'll pass it around. If y'all do that, I'm going to be outside. Y'all can do that, but I'm going to watch it online. I'm not going to be inside. Brother Moore, don't do no snakes now, okay? Uh, that and clowns are two things. Uh -uh, that don't work uh, for me. So I'm not suggesting that at all, all right? But I am saying that when God calls us, and there are times that we may have to be in harm's way, if God has called us, then he will provide for us and protect us. And he'll either protect us and we overcome it and go through it, or he calls us home. But either way, we are safe in the hand of God. Lottie Moon said one time, if I'm remembering what she said, as if I was having tea with her or anything, uh, but having uh, read uh, her uh, life story uh, just recently in, in y'all's library, or our, excuse me, in our library here at the church, the new Lottie Moon story. You ought to read it sometime. It is an awesome, amazing read. And she made the statement when she was facing all types of challenges and dangers uh, in China, she said that her faith in Christ was such, one is immortal until God chooses to call that person home. So therefore, whatever it is you're doing and God has called you to it, He will keep you in that until He's ready for you either to end that or to come home. We are as safe and secure as the Lord wills us to be, so we too can press the fight of faith. We can take it to the enemy. In our own mission field, Canaan, God intervenes and often in tandem and in proportion to our faith and faithful obedient action. He can confound the enemy that would confront us or critique his work or even criticize our worth to him. And as the Lord wills, he can smite, strike a fierce blow, allowing us to move forward. Such a blow in our context can change hearts. It can change minds. It can move people and redeem all kinds of situations. So therefore, yes, I pray, oh God, move this virus out of the way so that we can begin to have that normalcy. But in addition to moving it out of the way, oh God, use it as a catalyst to move us in our hearts so that we may be your people, that we may be your people according to your word, that we may be your people in work, and that we may be your people in worship. With the Lord both before us and behind us, will we dare to press the fight? In our mission field, depend on the Lord to put who or what would oppose us then to flight. His way, His time. Will we pursue with a relentless faith and a faithful resolve? Charles Spurgeon said, as I close, Charles Spurgeon got saved at a young age. I think he was about 15 or 16. And then about age 17 or 18, he became a pastor. But Charles Spurgeon said that in one of his diaries, in, in my 
office, I have the book by Louis Drummond, uh, The Prince of Preachers, which is, of course, Charles Spurgeon, and it has excerpts from his diary from him when he was a teenager. And he made the statement as he was struggling always to want to try to walk closer with, with God. Would today that our teenagers and children and young adults have that same sense of their need before God? Would we have that same sense of our need before God? But Charles Spurgeon made the statement that he hoped that he would have a love that would be um, as strong as death, a, faithful, uh, a faithfulness that would be, or a loyalty to God that would be as fierce even as hell, as, uh, hell, as, as in hell as in the place. In other words, uh, a faith that would not let go, irregardless. You know, for a 16-year-old, that's powerful. God calls us to that. He has said, I go before you, and I will not forsake you. This is the mission field that I have placed you in. And we're called to take possession of it. We will not surrender the field in 2021. So let us ask God, oh God, help us find ways to begin to reclaim that which COVID has uh, derailed or at least sidetracked for a while. Uh, that we ask God, oh God, help us to rebuild that which... Uh, life in this last uh, year uh, would tear down, rebuild and make stronger, make it bigger, make it bolder, make it awesome for your glory. Tonight the altar is open. If the Lord is calling you to make a decision, I invite you to come. It may be for, to trust the Lord for the very first time as your Lord and Savior. Nail it down tonight. E life is too short. Eternity is too long for an uh-oh. Okay, So no so. Don't think so. Hope so. I guess so. No so. And then it may be some other decision that the Lord is having you to make publicly, whatever that may be. The altar is open for you. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation this evening.